Thank you, Patsy. And good morning, Liberty Wesleyan Church. It's good to see you all in the house of the Lord this morning. And for those of you joining us online, it's good to have you too. And just remember to check out our links for our online bulletin and our giving and to comment and let us know who all is watching. So just a few announcements. First off is tomorrow is our American Red Cross blood drive. So I was told we have one last call. So if you have not signed up yet, please do so. Let Donna and Trish know. And you are required to wear a mask by the American Red Cross when you come. So please come prepared if you are donating. And if you're not donating, please donate. So also we have our Wesleyan Women's Meeting this Thursday. There is a sign-up sheet in the back. So please let us know if you want to attend that. All ladies are welcome. You can be a girl too. You don't have to be a woman. It's all right. Men, you're not welcome though. Also, our Young at Heart luncheon will be Wednesday, August 18th at Moose Cafe. So if you've not signed up for that, there are sign-up sheets for that available too or as well. Along with the Young at Heart trip on November, I think those are still available, right? For the trip to Myrtle Beach? Okay. Okay, so leaving the 14th to go to Tennessee, so if you've already signed up for that. And read your bulletin for all the other stuff we have going on. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Dear God, we just thank you once again for the ability to be in your house and in your presence, Lord. I just pray that, that we wouldn't take that for granted today and we'd be willing and open to hear whatever it is that you'd have to say through Reverend Loman this morning. And I just pray that your presence would just consume this place and each one of us would allow you to, to speak into our lives and allow us to leave here changed individuals this morning, Lord. I just pray for your continued blessings upon each and every one of us and that you would keep each and every one of us safe during the service and after the service, Lord. I just pray for your blessing on the service. In your holy and precious name, amen. Now Mark's going to come lead us. Good morning, Liberty Wesleyan. It's so good to see you this morning. At this time, the children can start to go down to Children's Church. And also at this time, if you will, stand with me and take your hymn books. It's not in your hymnal or in your bulletin this morning, but we are singing hymn number 743. Hymn number 743, Wonderful Peace. And we will sing verse 1, 2, 3, and 5. Verse 1, 2, 3, and 5.
Thank you, Mark. And we sounded good this morning. So as we enter a time of prayer this morning, there's a few requests I want to make note of. Just got to find them. First off, I want to remember the Shirley Hall family as she passed away this this past this is this past week. So just remember Donnie, that was his sister, and their whole family and her family as well as we go to the Lord in prayer. We also want to continue to remember Ken and Abby and also Mary Hockman as she's still recovering. And we want to remember our country and the things that are happening with the virus and everything else going on. We know all of that good stuff that's happening. So we want to continue to remember all that in prayer. And also Pastor Danny as he's still recovering with COVID, but at least he's home, so he gets to rest at home. So, so I hope I didn't miss anything. But if I did, I'm sorry. We'll cover it in prayer anyways. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Dear Lord, I just thank you once again for, for who you are and the power and the ability that you have to heal and to love us through each and every thing that we're dealing with, Lord. And I just pray that as we come to you this morning, both the requests that I've made known and those that I maybe was unaware of this week, Lord, that... I just pray for your hand upon each and every situation and that you would heal where healing is needed, whether it be physical, whether it be mental, or whether it be spiritual, Lord. And I just pray that you know exactly what needs to happen in each and every situation. And I just pray for, for you to do it. And I pray expecting that there will be healing and that your peace and your presence will be in each and every situation, Lord. And I also pray for, for each and every person who maybe has a request that they may not want to share or to let anybody else like in on, Lord. I just pray that you know the desires of each and every heart here, Lord, and you know the needs of each and every person, Lord. I just pray that you would help them to know that you're there and whatever it is, they have people around them that they can, they can look to for guidance, they can look to for healing, and they can look to for your love, Lord. And I just pray for your continued presence and blessing upon the service and and for healing and for your love to be shown through the words that are spoken and through the actions of everyone here. In your holy and precious name, amen. Now Mark's going to come minister in special music. I could not go on without Him, I know. This world would overwhelm my soul. I could not see the right way to go. When temptation o'er me rose, He whispers sweet peace to me. He whispers sweet peace to me. When I am cast down and troubled in soul, he whispers sweet peace to me. He speaks in a still small voice we're told it's a voice that dispels all my fears 
And when I'm cast down And I'm troubled in soul That still small voice I hear He whispers sweet peace to me He whispers sweet peace to me When I am cast down and troubled in soul He whispers sweet peace When I am cast down and troubled in soul, mm, he whispers sweet peace to me. Thank you again, Mark. And now I get the honor and the privilege of introducing our guest speaker today, Reverend Richard Lohman. So a little bit about him. Pastor Richard served the NC West District as senior pastor at Mount Airy Wesleyan for 15 and a half years before retiring, which in the Wesleyan Church, retiring means you get to go serve somewhere else. And then after his retirement at the end of 2015, he served as interim pastor at Winston-Salem First, Gastonia First, and Liberty Harmony. He is currently on staff at Mount Airy Wesleyan as visitation pastor and is married to Tammy, used to be Mahaley. And they have three sons and three grandchildren. And he serves as pastoral care coordinator for our district, which that's correct, right? Okay. And he helps out with a bunch of different stuff for our district. So he does a great job, and he's a great pastor and has done well, and he served his time, but he was more than happy to come visit us and help us out today so that I didn't have to do it again. So I really appreciate that. So please give a round of applause for Pastor or Reverend Logan. Thank you, Jordan. I didn't realize I was doing that much. <laughs> hey, it's great to see you today. Uh, you have received me so warmly this morning, and my wife, and I appreciate that. Um, and got a few things before I get started with my message. Pastor Danny called me last night and uh, wanted me to express to you his love for you how much he misses you and wishes he could be here. Uh, he's doing, I asked him how he's doing, he said better than last week. <laughs> so I'm glad that he is. And really one of the reasons I'm here is because the district wanted to help uh, you folks out. And uh, Jordan's got a heavy load on him while Danny's out, I know. And so they had asked if I would come and I, I gladly accepted that. But I will tell you this, I was thinking while I was getting ready this morning, how nervous I get now when I go preach for people I don't know, uh, or at least don't know very well. And I've been doing a lot of that. But uh, it was different when I was pastor in Mount Airy, you know, you knew those folks and they, would, they knew you and they didn't look at you like you had two heads and all that kind of stuff or that you were vertically challenged and all that kind of stuff. But uh, as I was thinking about that, and this has absolutely nothing to do with my sermon, okay? But I, was, I, I thought back at how nervous I was back when I was a 28-year-old guy that was just beginning my career in sales. Now, I didn't go into the ministry until late in life, and, and uh, I had been working at a, at a company in Salisbury for about seven years, and, and then I was, uh, for 
due to a number of circumstances, I went to work for McLean Trucking Company as a salesman. And I was in Atlanta. And this was back in 1972. And uh, one day, my, I'd just been there a couple months. And one day, my sales manager called me in his office. He said, listen, the, the vice president of sales is coming down, and he's going to work with you uh, for a day. Well, I want you to know, I was just a, you know, a little a young kid, and, and this vice president of sales, his name was Fred Bauer. He was a huge man, big guy. He played football at Carolina. And back in those days, I don't know if, it, I don't know if the generation today feels this way about people, but back in, in that time, you felt like that these people were just right next, up there with God, uh, especially if they had a big title. And I was so scared, especially, it didn't help much because my, that my sales manager said, now listen, this is what you're going to need to do for Mr. Bra Mr. Bauer. You're going to have to, on the day he comes, you're going to have to meet him for breakfast at the Marriott and don't be late. Uh, 7 o'clock, you'd be sure and be there before 7. He said, also, I want you to, Type out a little bit of a, a few notes about the people you'll call on and give him that so he'll know a little bit about who you're going to see. And also, uh, make sure that you schedule your calls uh, in a geographically uh, or convenient order so you won't be driving too many miles. I had all this you know, going on in my head. And so then uh, the day came, and I was so nervous I couldn't hardly stand it. I mean, I was just scared to death. Well, I got up about 4 o'clock in the morning. I lived in Lithonia, and it was about a 25-mile drive to Atlanta, and you never knew what you were going to get in Atlanta on the way in. So I got in my car. Uh, I, was, I got in my car like at 6 o'clock in the morning and headed, down, headed back into Atlanta on I-20. And as, you know, my good fortune, it always happens, there was a, a wreck that had happened, and it had blocked my lane completely. So I sat there and I sat there. Finally, we did, did get going. And I arrived at the Marriott five minutes late. Mr. Bauer was not the most congenial man in the world. I don't know how he ever became vice president of sales. I hope none of his family is listening online. <laughs> <coughs> but he was just kind of a gruff kind of guy, you know. And so he was already sitting at the table when I went in and I tried to explain to him what had happened. Well, then... Uh, we, we drove to the, to the office, and you, oh, by, by the way, and you had to be out, you had to, the office, you had to be there at 8 o'clock, but you had to be out and on the street by 9. This was a law. So uh, when 9 o'clock came, I said, well, we, we need to go, Mr. Bauer, and so I jumped into my car, and I am shaking, literally shaking, and this big man sitting in my car next to me up here, you know, and I felt like a little worm looking up at him. And I thought to myself, I cannot go on this day like this. I have got to somehow break the ice and somehow feel comfortable with this guy. So this is what I did. You're so stupid now. I looked up at him and I said, Mr. Bauer, I want you just to relax and try to enjoy yourself because I, I don't want you to be intimidated because I put my pants on one leg at a time just like you do. I thought he'd think that was funny, you know. <laughs> he just looked at me like, you little pipsqueak. <laughs> well, anyway, it was a day. Let me put it that way. And the reason I told you all that is that's kind of the way I feel today. I don't want you people to feel intimidated. <laughs> okay, down to business. This morning I want to talk to you about a lesser known judge of the children of Israel and he's an unfamiliar personality in the Old Testament. And this is what the Bible says about a man by the name of Shamgar. Judges 3 verse 31 says this, After Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. He too saved Israel. After Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. He too saved Israel. Would you bow with me for just a moment? Father, we're so thankful that we can be in your house today. And we're so thankful that you're here. 
by the presence of the Holy Spirit. You promised us that where two or three are gathered that you would be in the midst of us and, and we know that and Lord, we just want to honor and glorify you today. I want to tell you that we love you and we're just so thankful that you love us. So would, I would ask today, Father, that you help me as I try to bring this message to these folks and to myself and that you truly would change us, that we, we would not be the same people when we leave this place as we were when we came in. And for all that's done here, we give you praise, honor, and glory. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Now, I've discovered in my life that it's not very difficult to have faith when everything is going well for me. When I have money to pay my bills, when I feel pretty well physically, when all my relationships are intact, when my family's doing well, it's not difficult to have faith when it seems that everything is going right. Everybody can seem to have faith when the circumstances around them are favorable, but it takes a special kind of faith to trust God when the circumstances are unfavorable. If you study the Word of God, you'll find that it is full of people who trusted God when things weren't going well, when circumstances were unfavorable. People trusted God regardless of the situation. You know the story of Moses and the children of Israel, and that's uh, one of my favorite stories of how God led them out of Egyptian bondage. I've mentioned many times in my preaching about the influence that my mother had on, on my life. And one of the great things that she did every night was she would gather all of us kids around her and that she would, uh, we would have family altar. Y'all ever, ever hear of family altar, by the way? I'm going to probably date myself by saying some things today, but family altar right, really is important. Can I just go down a little path here? That probably had more to do with me, I guess, being where I am today than anything I can think of. We, we, we learned about things as a family. We, and my mom believed in teaching her kids about the Bible and what it said. And then we would all have to pray together. Now, I want you to know I was just like any other kid. I didn't always enjoy it especially when my mother prayed. She prayed long prayers. But, that, you know, and, and I came to treasure those prayers later on in my life. But anyway, sometimes, though, she would read from the Bible most of the time, but sometimes she would read from those, we, we had these little books, Bible story books, and you may have seen those. I used to see them sometimes in a doctor's office. They were wonderfully illustrated stories of the Bible, and I loved it when she would read to us from those books. And we could look at the pictures. That's how I learned many of the Old Testament stories. And the Red Sea Crossing was one of my favorites. But the circumstances were unfavorable for Moses. He had the Red Sea in front of him. Uh, and Pharaoh's army behind he and, and the children of Israel. And they were closing in on them. And things didn't look very good for them. And you all know the story how God caused the wind to blow. And a great path appeared before them and they passed through the Red Sea on dry ground. I love this story. There was this elderly lady in the church and she loved to hear about the Red Sea crossing. And every time the preacher preached about that or anything was said about that, she would get blessed. By the way, that's something else. Do you remember know what getting blessed means? I hope you do. She'd get blessed. And there was this young boy in there. He could never figure out why she would get blessed at that. It just seemed to be so common to him. But then the boy went away to seminary. And he had learned a lot. So he came back to, and was in the service one day. And sure enough, the preacher preached about the Red Sea crossing. And this little lady got blessed again. And the, guy, the boy kind of said, I'm going to make that old lady feel foolish today. He said, listen, I've been to seminary, and I, I learned in seminary that it was only two inches of water in the Red Sea when they went over. The woman got blessed again. He said, why on earth are you getting blessed? 
She said, well, I'm so thankful I serve a God who could drown Pharaoh's army in two inches of water. <laughs> but you see, regardless of the circumstances that we have before us, I want you to understand this morning, we serve a God that is able to see us through. We be, when we believe God, no matter how dark it gets, no matter how hopeless it may appear, we serve a God, as my dad used to say, who would bankrupt heaven if necessary to pour out his grace upon his people and sustain them through difficult times. Now, there are many great warriors of the faith that we could talk about today, but this sermon, as I said earlier, is not about a well-known person. It's not a, uh, a sermon about a man like Jeremiah or Moses or Isaiah or any other of the great notables of the, New of the Old Testament. This message is about an ordinary man, much like you and me. He was a farmer. And it's amazing how God used this man, Shamgar. But let me give you some background about what's facing Shamgar and what's surrounding this one verse of Scripture found here in the book of Judges, chapter 3. Shamgar lived in a time when the situation didn't look very good for the people of Israel. It didn't look favorable for a mighty move of God. Here's what had happened. The Philistine people, you remember, were uh, constant enemies uh, to the people of Israel. And, and they had come in and they had virtually conquered them and subjugated all the blacksmiths so that they couldn't manufacture any weapons in order to do battle with the Philistines. These Philistine tyrants, they were absolutely horrible. They would come into the land of the Israelites and set fire to the crops and they would pillage and plunder their household goods. And they would burn their houses to the ground, and they would rape the women, and they would kill the small children. And it seemed that despair had taken hold of the people of Israel. There was a, a dark cloud of depression and defeat that hung over all those people in Israel. It appeared that these godless Philistines had the upper hand, and where they were continually, day after day, week after week, year after year, is tyrannizing the people of Israel. And what was worse, the people of Israel had, had come to accept defeat. They had lost their fight. They had lost their willingness to, to stand against their godless en enemies, and they didn't really care anymore if they could worship God. It was a horrible, horrible environment there in Israel at this time. And just let me say this this morning. It's bad enough to be defeated, defeated by Satan. But what's worse is to become content with being defeated by. But I'm terribly glad that we don't have to live like that. I'm so glad that we don't have to live defeated lives. Listen, I know that we live in a world that has gone crazy with sin. I live in the same world you do, and I know that, and you know that. We live in a society that has no respect for God or the Word of God. We live in communities you probably would be amazed that they could care less if they didn't have a church in town. But yet we live in what is sometimes called the Bible Belt. But we live in that, that kind of society today, and sometimes if we're not careful, we're kind of drummed into silence to where we no longer have a desire to see a mighty moving of God, to where we're just, to where we're just maintaining. And let me tell you today, God is not pleased with that. And God can't do much more for you or me unless we stop having just a maintenance mindset when it comes to building the kingdom of God. But I believe that we can live victoriously today, even in a society like ours. And we can see God do fresh and mighty things in the lives of individuals and in the life of the church. You say, Richard, well, that's easy for you to say, and that's pretty good preacher talk, but you really don't understand my circumstances. Well... You're right, I don't know what you have to deal with every day. But if I understand the word of God, and it's true, and, and if it's true, and I believe it's true, there is nothing can, that can overcome me by the enemy. There is nothing that can take me out of the hand of God, that can separate me from his love, and I can live in victory. We don't have to be beaten down and defeated and wish for better days, and wish for the soon coming of Jesus Christ. I believe he wants to do something fresh and new in our lives these days. And then again you ask, Richard, how can that be? Well, I think Shamgar gives us some in insight in how that can be. 
if, if you look at this verse, and you may not have seen it when we read it, but it's very obvious that Shamgar was possessed with a divine discontent. And you know, we, we live in a world of discontent, don't we? I mean, everywhere you look, there's discontentment. There's political discontentment. People are dissatisfied with the way our country's being run, and, and I mean by both parties. There's a moral discontent. I think in reality, every serious person who truly has their finger on what is happening in our nation morally is discontent when it comes to the state of things. We've come to a point in our nation that seems anything goes, and very few people seem to object. But still, serious people who are moral in their behavior are discontent in the state that we're in, in our nation. But there's a difference in that kind of discontentment and a divine discontentment. Let me tell you what I mean by this. I probably should have had this put up on the screen. Let me put it this way. We will never have a fresh witness of God's Spirit if we're satisfied to live without it. I'm going to repeat that. We will never have a fresh witness of God's Spirit if we're satisfied to live without it. An unsaved person will never get sa saved if they're satisfied with the way they're living and they're just hoping for the best. We must have a divine discontentment. We, we need to get hungry for God, folks. If you would ask me this morning what I think we need more than anything else in the church today and what I would want to see more than anything else in the church today... Uh, I'll tell you that what we need and what I long to see is for the people of God to have a real hunger for him. To have a new hunger for him. You see, a person will never rise above the level of mediocrity as long as they can just go through the motions of doing church and be satisfied with that. We must get hungry for God and ask him to give us a desire to go deeper with him than we, have, than we are right now. My brother Lane, and I know many of you know him, he's held revivals in this church. He was telling how he and my dad had held a revival together in a church in Richmond, Virginia, many years ago, and, and they were to take turns preaching and singing in their services. And they were really excited about going to this church because they had been there before, and, it, and, and my dad and, and Lane knew it was a great church. And they were getting cards from the people uh, in the church prior to the meeting telling Lane and Dad that they had been praying for weeks for revival services and they were expecting great things to happen. But nothing really happened in the first few services. The moving of the Spirit was expect, uh, that, that they had expected really didn't take place. But on Saturday night, it was Lane's night to preach. But when he got up, a young man... Uh, who was sitting on the second row, stood up, and he said, Lane, I don't mean to interrupt, but I feel like I need to say this. And this is what he said. We've not seen the revival that we prayed for. But it's not your fault, and it's not your dad's fault. He said, tonight, I take responsibility for that. He went on to say, my wife and I got into an argument before coming to church. And I wanted to leave church early enough to make the pre-service prayer meeting, but she couldn't get ready in time. So I got angry with her, and she got angry with me. And so we argued all the way to the church, and by the time we got here and went down the aisle, we had already been defeated by the enemy. So Lane closed his Bible, and he said, well, let's meet the enemy on our terms. Why don't you ask your wife uh, to come to the altar with you, and let's ask God to do something new in you. And then Lane said, there may be others who need to come tonight. And God's been dealing with, with things in your life, and, and you need to come. Lane said, I really wasn't prepared for what had happened. He said, people from all over the church literally flocked to the altar. People three and four deep praying and, uh, at, at the altar that night. And then he said, revival broke out as a result of that, and the, the, the revival was extended three more days, and because of that revival, 70 people joined the church and a spiritual awakening took place in that church. Why do you think that was? Well, it was because a young man said, I'm not happy with, what, with, with what's going on 
He had a divine discontentment, and he was willing to accept responsibility for, for that from a personal standpoint. And you and I need to do the same thing. We must have a divine discontentment if God is going to do anything fresh in our lives and in, and in the life of the church. I heard this story about a young boy around the turn of the 20th century. He was riding home from Sunday school one day uh, in an open-air trolley. His Sunday school teacher had given him a little track. By the way, you all remember what tracks are? These are little pieces of paper that people hand out that says something about Jesus. The track was entitled Faith in God. And as he's riding, he's reading his track, and the wind came up and took the track out of the little boy's hand. And, and in frustration, the little boy says, Stop! The trolley, I've lost my faith in God. And the lady sitting close to him said, Well, man, isn't that cute? And the man sitting close to the lady said, Ma'am, he's got more sense than most of us. At least he, he has the sense to recognize that he's lost his faith in God. And the truth is, some of us won't stop our frenzied pace long enough to see if we have real faith in God. We must be possessed with a divine discontentment. And I encourage you this morning, I, I implore you today, don't leave this place if, if, you're, if your spiritual life is stale. Don't leave this service this morning if you're backslidden. And, and maybe by all appearances, things may seem that everything is all right between you and God, but you know deep down in your soul that that's just not the case. Shamgar was possessed with a divine discontentment. The second thing I, that we find out about Shamgar when I read this one verse, he was not only a man who was possessed with a divine discontentment, he was a man of great faith. Look at, the verse, look at this verse again. After Ehud came Shamgar, the son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad, and he, and he too saved Israel. You know, it doesn't take a whole lot of faith to say, I believe God uses a person. It doesn't take a whole lot of faith for me to say, yeah, Billy Graham was a man who was mightily used of God. It doesn't take a whole lot of faith to say that. But you know what? It takes a lot of faith to say, I believe God can use me. One day Shamgar is, is, is going about his daily duties. He's a farmer, and he's out in the field tilling the soil with his oxen, and something attracts his attention up on the hillside, and he sees a contingency of Philistine soldiers with spears pointing toward the sky, and uh, their shields glistening in the sun, and he's prodding those oxen along with an old ox goat. You know what an ox goat is? It, it's a stick about 30 inches long, and it's blunt on one end. And the reason it's blunt on one end is because if it's sharp and he's prodding the oxen, it might pierce their skin and cause an infection to set in and kill the oxen. So the stick has a blunt end to prod the oxen to keep them in the row as they plowed the ground. And here's Shamgar plodding along, prodding those oxen, and he sees those Philistines up on the, up on the ridge and he, and, he, and in the back of his mind, he thinks, I wonder which one of my neighbors those soldiers are going to pillage and plunder today. It was a regular thing that, that happened. And he continues to prod the oxen, and he looks up again, and instead of them riding off in another direction, he sees those Philistines uh, turn their horses toward his property. And they begin to run down to where he is. So what does Shamgar do? Well, he runs to the house and he tells Mrs. Shamgar to get all the little Shamgars together and go hide in the cave. And then he says, I've got business today to do today, and I may die in the process, I may be killed today, but I'm going to trust God to use me to stop these Philistines. And the Bible says he struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goat. He, he could have made excuses. He could have said, I'm a farmer, I'm not a fighter. And all I've got is an ox goat. I, I don't have a spear. I don't have a sword. But evidently, Shamgar wasn't good at making excuses. So he stood his ground. And God came upon a man, that man and, and that day, and he slew 600 Philistines. Now, now we hear that, and, and I don't know about you, but sometimes we just hear that, and that just passes right by. Now, I have 
I'm not bragging about this, and, I, and, and believe me, I'm not ashamed of it, really. But when I was a kid, I'm going to blame it on my oldest brother and my cousin. They made me a fighter. <laughs> I mean, Eddie Ray was six foot four, and well, he, he grew to be a man when he was six foot four, but when he was little, he was bigger than me. Eddie Ray was my next door neighbor. And Eddie and I didn't like each other much back then. Now, I'd love to see Eddie Ray today. Eddie, if you're listening or watching, I live in Mount Airy, man. Come see me. But anyway, they used to take us down. Eddie, my, my brother and my cousin, they used to take us down to the barn. And we only had one pair of boxing gloves. So they would put, they would put one boxing glove. I, 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 don't, I don't remember if I had the boxing glove on my left or the right. But anyway, they would wrap the other hand in cloth. And then they'd make us fight each other. Well, I, I knew this, I mean, because I had my brother in my corner, and Wade, my cousin, was in Eddie's corner, but Wade wouldn't tell Eddie how to fight. My, my brother would tell me. And so he said, when you get in there, hit him in the nose. Well, the fight was over. That's what I'd do. I'd hit him in the nose, and the fight would be over. His mother didn't like it much, but the fight was over. But I... But I, 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 I and I did that. I, I, I just didn't know that was in, any other way to solve an argument up until somebody hit me in the nose. <laughs> but can you imagine taking on 600 people? I just want you to think about that a minute. Taking on 600 people with a stick. Now, I know he didn't do it with his own strength because he had God. God came upon him and did that. last part of that verse says, he too saved Israel. One man. One man with an ox carry. And that tells me something this morning. God can use anybody. God can use anybody willing to be used. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your talents may be. It doesn't matter whether you can sing or not sing. It doesn't matter if you're educated or uneducated, if you would just allow him to use you. You say, okay, what's in this story for me today? Well, I want to give you some things very quickly. First thing, get dissatisfied with yourself. Now, that's tough to do because most of the time we're pretty comfortable where we are. We have our routines. We know what we do every week. We know what we do every Sunday. But, but if we're going to see a, a, a God move in ways we haven't seen him move recently, we're going to have to take personal inventory and maybe get dissatisfied with what we've been doing. You know, there's an old saying that, uh, that I kind of live by. It says, if you keep on doing what you've been doing, you keep on getting what you've been getting. And uh, so if you're not satisfied with what you've been getting, we need to change something. Secondly, go out on a limb, exercise your faith. Someone has said that we're so afraid of going out of limb that some of us have stopped climbing trees spiritually. Exercise your faith. Repent thoroughly. Sometimes I, I think even good people need to fall on their knees and say, God, forgive me for my indifference. Forgive me for not being more accessible to you. Number four, pray through. Pray until you touch God's throne. Number five, make restitution whenever possible. Maybe the reason God's not moving in your life is because you're not living up to all the light he's shed on your path. Maybe he's told you to do certain things and you're not willing to do it, and as a result, you're just sort of stuck spiritually. Or maybe you need to go make something right with somebody else. And you say, no, preacher, you stop preaching now and you've gone to meddling. Maybe there's a grudge you have against somebody and you're unwilling to forgive. Well, I say this with all the love in my heart for you. You can't expect to be right with God if you're not right with your brother or sister in Christ. Make restitution whenever possible. 
Reopen your Bible and obey it. If we're not satisfied with where we are spiritually, get into the Word more thoroughly than we have been. But don't just get into the Word. Begin to obey it. Can you imagine what, what would happen if everybody did that? Number seven, be serious-minded. Sometimes we just need to block out all the frivolities of the world and get serious about serving God. Number eight, be hungry for righteousness. Be hungry for righteousness. After Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goat, he too saved Israel. So let me ask you this morning, do you have a divine discontentment with things spiritually? Do you want more of God in your life? How about your faith? Do you have a great faith? Or have you lost your faith? In a moment, I want to lead us in prayer. And I don't know about you, I don't know if this message was for you or not. I believe it was for somebody. If it hadn't been, I don't think the Lord would have laid it on my, on my heart to preach today. But maybe you'd just like to come to the altar. And by the way, you know, this is a great place to meet with God. And I know during COVID, we didn't do that. But uh, I want to open the altar this morning. And maybe you'd just like to, to come and uh, have a talk with the Lord today. But whether you come up here or stay in your seat, I want to urge you to allow the Holy Spirit to examine your heart and allow him to do what he wants to do in you this morning. I'm going to ask Patsy to come. And she's going to play something softly. And if you'd like to come, I'm just going to wait a moment if you'd like to come down to the altar and have a word of how to talk with the Lord this morning. I invite you to come at this time. Now wait just a moment. Father, thank you again for being here this morning. And I want to pray for this congregation. Lord, I, I pray for the people here. And ask that you would send revival. I know this is a good church. I know it's a great church, and I know they've got a wonderful pastor a wonderful assistant pastor and other great lay people who lead this church. But Lord, our nation needs revival. Our churches need revival. And we need, we need a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives individually and in the church. So I pray today that if this message has been for someone, and quite frankly, Lord, I know it's been for me as well. I do want more from you. But I know in order to have that, I've got to give more of me. So, Lord, would you just take away anything that takes place, first place in our lives other than you? May we put you in your proper place in our lives and our priorities and get those in order. Lord, I know if we'll do that, I, I believe that we will see a fresh, a fresh uh, anointing from you in the church and in our lives. Thank you for allowing me to be with these good people. And I pray again that you would touch Pastor Danny and, and, and Tana and these other folks that have been prayed for earlier today. Thank you for hearing our prayer. I pray you'll answer it according to your precious will. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.